be using a little bit of math there. And so um, this project for me comes from a long way when I started understanding pattern formation. And I'm here, I'm showing you two pictures from different, very different contexts, but they have similar um, visual uh, signatures. So here you see uh, Ray Light Bernard convection cells when you have a difference of temperature between the bottom of this Petri dish and the top. And, there's a, and there's a critical difference in the temperature that produce these convection cells. And they organize in this very um, hexagonal patterns. And there is a, some imperfection there from nature, I'd say. And then here you have um, amoeba aggregating. So when uh, food is completely depleted, amoeba try to look for new places. And this process starts with aggregation. And then you can see so the formation of this type of clumps that uh, amoeba produce there. But I'm very interested in understanding this out of equilibrium structures can inform us about what is going on at the microscopic level. So what is happening at the very tiny scale there? And, and how can we probe those behaviors just by looking at these macro level uh, observations? This is a very um, classical example that I can show you. So this is a, a Bain Jacob did a lot of work in, in bacteria pattern formation. And here in your left, there is a basically very stupid bacteria, simple ones that are just moving around randomly and reproducing, but they don't have any like special interaction mechanisms. But bacteria can sense each other using chemicals or many types of signals. And when they do, you see a difference in pattern formation. So the tree like here and the ramification and, and the rate of ramification change a lot. And we can just by watching this difference in, in spatial patterns, and then identify that the bacteria here, in this case, is performing chemotaxis, or they are sensing each other through chemical signals. Sorry, yeah. This is a picture of what? This is a bacteria that started here uh, developing in the center. So just a drop of bacteria, a couple of them there in the center. They start growing, and they form this, uh, this tree-like patterns here, because they are reproducing and moving around. And here is the same. But the difference is that here we have interaction between them. They are sensing each other, and here they don't. So what do you mean they don't sense each other? So they, of course, they collide, like contact process. They bump into each other, they sense. But here they have more long-range uh, uh, interaction. So one bacteria is releasing some toxin, toxin or substance, and the other one very far away is, is sensing them. So we have a, a long uh, interaction by distance in this case, and here we don't. So this, uh, this change in pattern are giving us information about the presence of this interaction mechanism there. Okay. Is it just a, I assume the, the bacteria in the middle is the oldest, is that why? Yeah, they're... yeah, that would be the case there. They typically tend to die at a long, long time. Yeah. One is radial, the other has some direction. That's yeah, cool. yeah. So uh, in, the, in this paper, the, the author is related to, the, to the, the fragmentation, to the ramification rate so the ramification rate is completely different in those two cases. That's uh, just uh, a qualitative way of detecting this type of things. Okay, it's complete. For me, it's still a mystery. I have no idea why you think the circular is more interacting than the first. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, you don't. You just see after you, you, you simulate those things, and you try to understand different type of species, and you see the difference occurring. Well, I'm, I'm not doing the effort now because, uh, yeah, we are going to move forward now and jump to a next thing. Just, just, this is one of the first examples in which chemotaxis were seen as a change in pattern formation. But you can't say heuristically why this pattern is more interacting than the first one? Mm, I don't have a good uh, explanation for that now. Does anybody have, <laughs> Does anybody have an explanation? Yeah, so like there, there are two types because I, I don't want to dig deep in the chemotaxi. So chemotaxis can be attractive or repulsive. No, that's I understand. Yeah. I just don't understand why the circular thing is more interacting than the one with the right. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, I don't remember exactly the model, but probably here they are attracting each other and they are performing these more aggregated for, types of forms. Okay. I just want to know what, what the arrow has anything to do with the two pictures. I don't see any correlation between interaction and symmetry. The interaction the second one? But I don't know. The second one is obviously more symmetric, but I have no idea why that's more interesting. Well, I mean, that's yeah. that probably, I, I, don't, I, I think it's in that paper, but what many people do is they measure the fractal dimension of these objects. 
Yeah, but neither one's like a more mechanistic explanation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So that's, yeah. uh, I think so interactions diminish the dimension of the coin? In the sense, yes. In the theory, yeah. Okay, I give up. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I want I a logical explanation. I don't, I mean, and if it depends on many things, depends, then. Depends on the type of interaction. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, right yeah, 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 yeah. I understand. So if yeah. they help each other, they tend to aggregate. If they find, they tend to segregate. I understand. Yeah. No, no, that part I understand. I just don't understand what the. That's a good question, and I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this is something that I've been uh, doing myself, so trying to understand how spatial patterns from the macroscopic level can infer things at the micro level. So I wanted to establish a connection between individual level, how the properties of the elements are connected to the macroscopic emergent properties of these cases. And more interesting, we also, I've been working, uh, of course, with Ricardo and, and other collaborators. Those two things are connected due to evolution, evolution process. So the macro is generate, the micro is generating the macro, but the macro also feedbacks to the micro, and these two things are dynamically coupled. And this is a very interesting thing, uh, just a broad picture of where this idea that I'm going to present to you today comes from and uh, what, I'm, what I have in mind. So today we are going to talk about phytoplankton blooms. So here you can see satellite images of uh, phytoplankton blooms in the sense that the colors there from, from blue to red represent phytoplankton concentrations. So blue you have little or non phytoplankton and red you have a lot of phytoplankton. And this is at a very long time scale, times of weeks, months, and turbulence is moving those things in space and creating these very complex spatial temporal patterns. And they can occur close to the shore, they can appear suddenly in the center, as you can see now. Um, and phytoplankton is really important for primary production. They um, are really important for carbon cycle, and they uh, actually almost half of the global primary production comes from phytoplankton. So phytoplanktons are the important basis of the, the food web and the ecosystem that is if they are regulating everything actually. So we start from phytoplankton, then other layers of uh, animals are eating them and then cascade into higher levels. Do you know how much that was sped up? Yeah, that, that's, really, that's really fast. So uh, I think uh, four or five seconds is like two weeks. So this is a really, really long, long time. And uh, so this is like the top um, quality that we can get now. This is actually from the same in initiative that is uh, paying us for doing the research I'm going to present today. They have this uh, Seahawk project. They are getting like very... Um, high resolution images, so 120 meter resolution is a very good resolution for phytoplankton detection. And um, yeah, just to show you where we are at now. So the, the smallest scale that we can get a satellite image is 120 meters. So this is much, much larger, is still much, much larger than the phytoplankton itself, which is like tiny, tiny, tiny. I'm going to show you an image uh, later. And of course, uh, other things are eating phytoplankton and we cannot see them. So this, we need to actually um, perform uh, a transect. So this is a, a big phytoplankton bloom here. And this, of course, is not uh, doing an experiment. It's just a ch ship uh, uh, crossing the, the, the phytoplankton bloom. But w what scientists actually do, they, they do the same um, line here, carrying this guy here. This is a very old school drawing that I like very much from the 70s, bad fish. So this device is being dragged, dragged by the ship and counting the particles that it sees. So like zooplankton, fishes, it sees things around. Those things are not seen from satellite images. So there are a lot of things that we cannot see just by watching from satellite images in this case. And the general result for this, this type of uh, spatial produced by um, phytoplankton and other species are uh, summarized here. So the, I would try to, to pose this in a, in, a, in, a, in a clear way in the sense that we start from the temperature, which is the abiotic physical part of the system. And then the temperature, of course, control phytoplankton bloom. And then zooplankton is eating phytoplankton. And as you can see, as we go down or up, if you wish, in a trophic level, 
uh, we, go, we start from the bases, and then phytoplankton is the plant, and the zooplankton is eating, and noise is increasing here. And this is typically characterized in terms of this, the spectrum of the spatial structure. So we start with a very smooth, abiotic, physical contribution, and then biology try to push things to more a white noise thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm measuring this. So this is this spatial frequency. So here, if I have a flat, a flat spectrum means a pure white noise in space. So they are just uncorrelated fluctuations in space as I move with my ship. But fluctuations are not uncorrelated, they are correlated. And here, you can see a very smooth one, for instance. And the spectrum is very, uh, the slope of the spectrum is very uh, high. Ah, yeah, yeah, so it's just a measure of the transect. So the ship started dragging the device at a certain uh, point, and this is, would be the zero. And then the, it, the, the ship dragged for uh, 60 kilometer. It's not the shore, not anything. It's just a place in the ocean that the, the measure was taken there. Why should frequency be relevant? Should be any frequency at all? I yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that it started very empirically. They measured this just by trying to, so the first result, they, there is no mechanistic explanation for that, and then later people start to develop theory to explain why this type of things are happening. In I just don't understand what kind of thing is supposed to be happening. I don't see anything happening. What am I supposed to be seeing? So this is an empirical result. This is, yeah. this is a measure. So this is, this is what they see. I understand. Yeah. What, what does this have to do with frequency? What I don't understand. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, this is actually shown to be connected to Social behavior of, of things at, at like zooplankton. So phytoplankton is known to be very planktonic, so it's very passive. So it's more connected to turbulence. So they are just being drifted by the flow. So they are not, not doing anything special. But as we go to zooplankton, zooplankton is more active. It's introducing another type of interactions there. So this guy is, a, is it was assumed previously before doing the measure that phytoplankton should be well correlated to temperature because it, Passive substance. And zooplankton is not so passive, and then it, there is a difference there. And people have tried to explain this using uh, mechanistic models later on. Okay, so I think I so you're measuring correlations between temperature and fire and fire That I understand, but I don't understand. Yeah, this is just a, a in, like a, in the Fourier spectrum. It's just measuring the, the roughness of this, like of this profile, and and in the Fourier spectrum, the correlation is just a, it's just there, right? So flat spectrum, it directly shows you there is no correlation, and you can use like a, the Fourier spectrum is the is the this spectrum is the Fourier transform of a correlation function, right? So it's the same thing in Fourier space, just a way of uh, qualitative showing how correlated things are. So very steep slope means strong correlations, and flat slope means no correlations and white noise thing. So, so temperature, you say, is correlated. But temperature is correlated with what? What's the blue line? Yeah, because turbulence is not uncorrelated. Sorry? Turbulence is not uncorrelated. Turbulence has shown to exhibit a, a, a power law spectrum. So turbulence exhibit like, a, depending on the regime that you watch turbulence, you can see a slope of minus three or a slope of minus five. And this is what we know already from turbulence. Slope means, you're measuring slope of something versus something. Right? Sorry, maybe I'm being ignorant, but I just don't understand what your graph, what your graph is showing me. You say blue, so blue corresponds to temperature. Yeah. So I'm, I can see this graph. Yeah. What's that graph have to do with that blue line? Yeah, so this is, a, yeah. So, if you, if you understand how correlations are translated to the Fourier space, you, you can see that because he is very correlated, so you should see a very steep slope here. And you can understand this just by doing the Fourier transform of a correlation function. Temperature is correlated with what? I just don't understand. With itself. With itself. With itself. So everything is correlated with itself. I mean, that's a, it's temperature, not no. No, no. I just don't understand. Is it fluctuations of the temperature? Is yeah. You're yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, so you're basically. Right, so how the point at location X plus 
so, so if temperature was constant, what would, what would the graph be? It would be fully correlated, oh, yeah. It would be yeah. straight, it would be hard work. Yeah, yeah, it would be like a delta function. Or. So if temperature were constant, it would just, it would just be a vertical line, right? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I actually don't know why they came up, but, but this type of uh, characterizing the spatial pattern using uh, the spectrum was something that started since the beginning because we knew, that to, we knew the spectrum of tubulins and people wanted to understand how the biological factors would change this physical property that we know. We know that, the, for instance, that the velocity, uh, the energy in a tubulins decay as a power law in the, in the, in the spectrum. So we know that. Okay, I don't yeah. know if you can yeah. If your temperature is a sine function or cosine function, then your relation, your equation should have a peak at the frequency of the sine function. That's I understand. Yeah. That's flat, then it's a zero because it's a whole thing. That's I understand. So if it was a sine function, then you would have a periodicity. But this is, for me, has absolutely no period. Yeah, but if it's going to be a periodicity, right? Then you can't I understand. Okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay, yeah, this is relevant because this is what uh, created the first foundation for the, what they, people did and know about. Yeah, yeah. Butcher, when you say butcher, do you use it as a synonym of moisture, or do you actually have, like, patches in the distance? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Actually, I don't like the word patcher because you don't see patches here, right? They are, yeah, but they use. Okay, but it's not uh, patchy in that sense. No. But yeah, but, but they call this patchiness mean aggregation means, which is can be misleading and yeah. Sort of spatial yeah. Uh, yeah, but it, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I prefer noisier. It makes like it's more intuitive to understand. Yeah. Okay, but this is well known from the 70s. But more recently, people started to have a look what is happening at the millimeter scale. So I'm showing patterns here. So uh, I'm showing grazers. So grazers are zooplankton, and grazers are not only being uh, drifted by the flow. They can swim, and they can sense things. This can be like very um, impressive capability to sense things in a very turbulent environment, but people have shown that this is possible. And you can see here an example of grazers, like a little bit of uh, copepods here, uh, sensing this big blob of organic matter. They can sense this big blob and move towards it. And they, uh, of course, is going to introduce correlations at the microscopic st structure. And here, there's a very nice paper um, showing bacteria. And these green things uh, here show the, the concentration of nutrients that perform this very filamentous structure. And bacteria can actually track those filamentous structures because they can sense them and swim towards it, even in a very turbulent environment. And here's just another example. So this is just to show that those kilometer scale patterns that I showed in the beginning are being, all, we also see millimeter scale patterns. And there's a, a very uh, interesting problem about scale here. And, uh, and the thing is that individuals are not just going with the flow and they can cut through noise. This, this type of things, there's a very well explained in these uh, two recent reviews by uh, Taylor and one with Simon. So they actually explore the idea that this is actually possible and we have complex structure also at the macroscopic scale. And uh, so we have a problem um, of scale. We have, at the millimeter scale, we have different things going on. We have things swimming. We have formation of clumps. We have aggregation of organic matter. And at, at long, long range, like kilometer scale and long time, we have the impact of other type of mechanisms. And what we've been applying to these cases is applying the notion that uh, I learned very well in this paper by Peter Anderson, is that the only way to solve this is to set laws for each scale. So let's, let's work with the kilometer scale. So I'm going to write an equation to work with the kilometer scale. If we want to understand the millimeter scale, let's include all the ingredients that we need to work with the millimeter scale. And we have a problem that th those type of methodologies and approaches are uh, fragmented and we don't have a connection between them. So this is the, how the literature is divided. 
So to understand millimeter scale, people have developed individual-based models in which we can make very complicated uh, species. We can include all the ingredients that we want in our little living thing that, that's, that's there. And very, uh, very precise because we can put all the ingredients that we want, but that is not scalable. We cannot scale this type of simulations. Perhaps simulate a hundred, a thousand. I've been simulating ten thousands of these guys, but we cannot go beyond that. And to simulate a kilometer scale phytoplankton boom, it's not feasible. And to solve this problem, people have worked with density field descriptions. So we write a PDE for our concentration field, and uh, we try to work the kilometer scale. So we have two methodologies that are decoupled in terms of how we do things and how they are connected. We can, in some cases, in very special cases, connect these two extremes, but in general, this is not possible. So, sorry. Yeah. Generally, not in general. For a very simple, I, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to do the simplest case that you can imagine when you have an attraction between things and you end up not able to close things because of higher order terms, or you need to truncate, make approximations. And when you do this, you lose a lot of how traits regulate the, the large scale patterns. I want to establish a very strong connection between micro and macro. And to do this, uh, analytical methods have shown to fail in many cases. So basically what you're going to introduce is a, a way to do that connection better than the way that we're doing it. Yeah, I'm actually doing it. That's the difference. Because before, we can, actually, we can propose heuristically. We can say, so let me show you. So here we can write an, a, a program for that. If, if this happens, th this is gonna happen. We do like a logic uh, program for this and to, to, and to density field descriptions we can propose. And here you can see it's very already complicated. We see a response function here that is, uh, we have an only artist here. And what, what is Estelle doing here? He's trying to introduce what he thinks is reasonable. But he's doing this heuristically. He's not deriving this from, from first principle. And if he, he can do it, he's going to do for a very specific case, doing a lot of approximations, and he's going to lose a lot of the details about the connection between micro and macro. And this is my main point here. So what we did. So we construct an uh, individual-based model for a phytoplankton and zooplankton community. And we include the minimal ingredients. So I'm not doing a very complicated, but for this model already, analytical methods cannot do the micro-macro connection. So uh, we have a tube lens that I'm going to mimic using a specific type of model I'm going to go into details later. And we have a phytoplankton, which is our passive uh, living thing that is just being drifted by the flow. And the zooplankton is the predator, let's say, that's eating the, the phytoplankton. And the idea is to perform a coarse graining procedure. A coarse graining procedure has been used in physics and this is like, uh, I don't know, the backbone of uh, criticality and try, trying to understand universality. But here I'm going to do what people have done in, uh, more in chemistry. I'm going to do a computational cost graining procedure because I don't want to lose any of the details in the connection micro and macro. I want to have uh, a very precise connection between traits and large scale effects. And then this screening procedure is going to give me an equation. And this equation is going to be fully parameterized by the individual-based model. And I'm, I'm, the idea is that I'm, as a scientist, I let the individual-based model uh, show me what are the equations. I'm not going to derive them. I'm going to ask the individual-based model what are the equations that I should use. And this is, a, a, this is going to, this solves a, a, a good gap that we have in the literature and a very important one, and how behavior and macro scale is affecting large scale phenomena. This is not known. I'm going to show a couple of examples that uh, we can actually, as I said, we can bypass this problem trying to propose heuristic forms for the PDE, but this is not actually connecting micro and macro. And more importantly, since we know this connection, I can do what I said in the beginning. I can just watch large scale observations. I can watch an image from a satellite and say things about what's going in the macroscopic level without actually going there, doing a very specific measure to see what is happening. I can infer things just from very large scale observations. So let's show what it's, 
what we are talking about, actually. So phytoplankton is no motile, it's our passive thing, and uh, is the plant, let's say the plant of the ocean, and it's around 0.1 millimeters. It's very small. And, and zooplankton, which is eating phytoplankton, tends to be 10 times bigger than the phytoplankton, or, or even more. And this is the motile, and it is the predator of herbivores that is eating the phytoplankton. Uh, and I hope the movie, where is the movie, it's not working. Yeah, I don't know. But here you can see that this is the zooplankton, and those little spheres here are the, the, the phytoplankton. And the zooplankton, what the zooplankton do, he can sense phytoplankton around and make a jump. He jumps towards the phytoplankton and try to eat the phytoplankton. And this is a, you can see the scale here. And our model uh, is, we, we include this type of ingredients. We have a, a zooplankton that is, uh, being moved by turbulence, but the zooplankton is also trying to, to approach phytoplankton that around and sensed up to a perception range. The perception range of the zooplankton is, is really interesting because it can reach five to ten times the zooplankton size because he can sense the signals that are being sent. And the signals can be chemical, can be hydrodynamical. When the phytoplankton moves through water, it creates disturbances that can be felt by the zooplankton. And the turbulence model that I use is a low-cost one. So this is a, something that I mentioned before, Nathan. So, uh, so, so instead of uh, simulating the Navier-Stokes equation, I'm actually mimicking turbulence, in, turbulence placing vortices. So I'm placing several vortices with different sizes, and they are to, uh, rotating to one side and to the other side. And the important thing is that this point vertex model gives me the, the spectrum of the energy and how energy is distributed in a turbulence. So uh, due to a cascade phenomena, energy is transferred from large to small scales in turbulence, and the slope of this line here represents a feature that's well known in, in, in turbulence, and actually this slope can change depending on what type of scale that you are watching, and we can play a little bit of this. So here is the, the string function that I, pro that I proposed, and this is the, the actually the, the development comes from, the, from this expression here. And this is an example of a vortex that I introduced there. So there are several ones here. Sorry? M? Ah, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So because since we have periodic pattern conditions, we are looping the influence of the edges from several things. Yeah, that's a common thing to do. Suppose yeah. Sorry? I'm not sure I understand why. So turbulence, at least, is maybe the most complicated part of your, yeah. your description. But do you know the answer if you turn off turbulence? If I turn off turbulence? Yeah, does, this, does, this, does it somehow become easier to solve, or does it become impossible to solve? Or? Yeah, yeah we, we, lo we lose a lot of things, because the, the main thing in the partial structure is the mixing part of turbulence that is like and the zooplankton is not like that. The zooplankton wants to be close to phytoplankton. So we have this tug of war between the physical part that's trying to shake things around and the zooplankton is trying to be together. So if I remove turbulence, the zooplankton is going to like it because the zooplankton is going to find whatever he wants and be together. And there is no uh, um, fight against this uh, turbulent, uh, zooplankton behavior. So the, the spatial structure is controlled by this interplay between physics and biology there. Okay. If you turn off turbulence, do you know exactly what's going to happen or not? Is turbulence the thing that makes the, the problem interesting, or is turbulence the thing that makes the problem impossible to solve? Yeah, yeah. To yeah. Actually, uh, actually, for uh, small scale, like for very tiny scales, we can use just a diffusion approximation for turbulence, and this is much much cheaper in this case. But here we are going to use this to create a more just a more realistic picture of the the phenomena. But I could maybe approximate turbulence for a random field or just a, a more simpler thing there. Because as I said, people are worried about this type of scale-free uh, thing. So certainly a referee is going to ask what's the, what's the, the, the spectrum look like.
yeah, I could do this. This is just as for sake of uh, a realistic setting. I could simplify this a little bit more if I want. So, and, and to couple movement, to couple uh, demographic events, to couple how all those processes are playing a role there, we use this uh, time dependent Gillespie algorithm that uh, tells us um, that divide the process in movement and how things reproduce. And the, the time dependent Gillespie algorithm is really important because, in, in, in some cases, we have, a, for instance, in chemical reaction, the reaction rates are a constant. And, and we don't need to care about uh, time there. But in our case, someone is experiencing uh, phytoplankton in different ways. As time passes, we need to take care of this uh, time temporal fluctuations, and this is an important thing. And people have shown this in this, those papers here, how those type of, uh, how, how this method keep, uh, keep the fluctuations there as they should be. Uh, so okay, let's show some results. So okay, um, here I'm going to start from the micro, show what's happening in a very tiny scale, and then I'm going to move uh, to, to larger scales. So let's talk about centimeters. So we have 10 centimeters now. We have phytoplankton, zooplankton. The zooplankton is, is, is moving, is being moved by the flow, and is also moving by his uh, active uh, behavior. And the zooplankton can sense things at a one centimeter and the size of the zooplankton is 0 0.20 centimeter. I'm fixing this uh, based on, a, a, let's say, an average of the type of species that we are worried about and talking about uh, in this case. And to characterize the spatial patterns that I'm going to show, I define these two indices. One is associated to how phytoplankton and zooplankton are close to each other, and the other one is related to how uh, zooplankton are close between themselves. So, and I define these this two indices using the well um, uh as a reference. So we want to know how far from the well-mixed regime we are. So this is an important thing, because if, if we are in the well-mixed regime, things get much easier in terms of mathematical terms, and we can scale these things much easier, but this is not the case, and there's a critical point here. So with uh, passive grazers, tubulants, mix things, and there is no uh, interesting thing. So the two indices are close to zero, indicating that species are well mixed. So they, they are randomly distributed in space. But now I'm going to let the zooplankton swim. Swimming is going to uh, fight against this mixing property of tubulants. And of course here, if zooplankton is swimming, it's good that zooplankton more food. So this is the first, the first result, and this is the obvious one. So if you swim, you should get a reward for that, and then that, that's happening. Zooplankton is encountering more phytoplankton when swimming. But for some reason, zooplankton is also becoming aggregated. So zooplankton is not interacting. They are not trying to swim together. They are becoming correlated. So this is what uh, the literature would say, patchiness as Ricardo mentioned. A, so he's creating these clumps, even that they are not interacting directly. And let, let me show you what this means in terms of images. In the left, this is the well-mixed. Tube lens is doing this stretch and fold behavior, th uh, typical thing that we have in, in, in chaotic mixing. And here, um, we see the formation of clumps, and again, tubulants try to destroy those clumps. So we have a fight between this, again, this physical side of the problem and the biological side. This is a very extreme case, actually almost unrealistic, let's say. VZ is the swimming speed of the, of the zooplankton. So zooplankton here is not swimming, and here zooplankton is swimming on average 0 0.5 centimeters per second, which is quite high. Yeah, the red are the zooplankton, and these little, little dots here are the phytoplankton. It's correlated just because of the flow, right? Yeah, that's, that's, a, to that's a good question. So they, they, they are actually becoming correlated because of this thing here. So zooplankton that are sufficiently close, they end up, they end up sharing part of the, the local environment that they, that they sense. So th these two guys here are seeing both have an intersection here, and they are seeing these two phytoplankton here, and they have a, a probability of choosing the same guy. 
And when they choose the same guy, they become together, or come together. <laughs> so, uh, so they are not trying to swim together, but they become correlated, indirectly correlated, because they are trying to, to search for the same things. And this is what happened. And of course, this, is, this effect is, is controlled by two time scales, the turbulence time scale and the behavior time scale. And we can go from, if uh, turbulence is mixing things very fast, we get a well-mixed uh, uh, scenario. And if the time scale of behavior is much faster, I think here is not the time scale, but the, the velocity of the process. So if turbulence is very fast, we get well-mixed. And if behavior is very fast, we get clumps forming. So it's not the flow. It's, it's, it's the correlation coming from this behavior process. Which you're not certain claim they still Yeah, 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 sure. In a much more strong way. Yeah, yeah, because there is not, there is nothing fighting against this process. I don't think they would try to find, they would try to separate. Yeah, but but they, they should do it, right? So there is another guy here that is going to eat the same thing. I should go for it, but in this model, no, they. Do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a result that's well known in the case. Yeah. So I'm going to show an experimental result that that's uh, that evokes this this social behavior thing to explain uh, structural variation in phytoplankton blooms, and we're going to reach that point later. So let's try to scale this. We can discuss more about this individual level um, dynamics, and, but I'm going to try to move on and try to see how we can scale this, this. So we can try to write the equation for it. This is going to be challenging. I'm trying to show this tomorrow uh, using some examples. but you need to do approximations eventually. And we are going to lose how exactly traits are connected to things. This is not actually what, what I'm trying to say. We are not losing quantitative aspects. I'm not saying that we are having a, some, some functional form or some behavior that we are just losing some details. We're actually losing an essential part of the, the equations that we are going to see now. So uh, the procedure that I'm going to use is some you, they're borrowing some aspects from the SMC, which is called a direct simulation Monte Carlo that's being used to solve Boltzmann equation. So instead of, uh, uh, we, we use, for instance, the relative velocity between particles to understand the probability of collision, and we use this probabilistic heuristic to uh, actually say how things are colliding, seeing each other or not. So here I'm using the same concept, and this concept comes from, uh, uh, the first thing is to have what they call a rev, the re representative elementary volume. We need to find a big, a big system that we can say, this system represents the big picture of our uh, simulation. And, and, and as you can see, and if you know like critical phenomena, this is not going to be the case in a critical, in a phase transition because the correlation of phase transition uh, uh, become like uh, arbitrarily large, and we cannot encapsulate the structure produced in a phase transition. But here we can. Here our structures, our clumps, our formations have finite correlation, and we can select a, a system size sufficiently large to encapsulate the structure that we want to see. And that's the, what he's saying there. And here is just me trying to check. Uh, this is a, two types of measures, and just, just having in mind that after a certain uh, size, sufficiently large size, things get more or less constant and we can rely on this uh, a system, for instance, a system of 20 centimeters is what I use as a representative element volume for my case. Systems at the order of one, two centimeters are not good because they are at the order of the correlation of the structure. So, we are, so the structure is bleeding through the, through, through the volume that you selected. And basically, what, what we do is like we watch what is happening, and at an instant, so at, so we watch a snapshot, and we just keep track. So this is a very simple representation, and we can. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to give more details. So we watch, let's say, a box here, and we, we do like here we have a 100 centimeter size, which is the largest one that I could do in a parallel computing using the the fanciest thing that I could do. So we're talking about a 100 centimeter size volume, and I'm dividing this volume into any uh, centimeter size boxes. And those boxes have some, something inside, and they are exchanging particles at the edges, right? 
and I watch this box at a given instant, and I, and I see what happened in the next instant. And I keep track of the number of particles that were generated here, particles that, that uh, flow through the boundary, and I keep track of everything that happened and related to particle changes, and I try to write an equation as a function of the initial numbers that I, that I had before. So this is like a Markov process. So I, I know the state, uh, the, the, the present state, and I want to, ha to know what is happening, what, what are the changing particles in the next change, in the next state. And this, of course, is not related to reproduction, to eating, and also to the, to the fluxes through the boundaries here. And yeah, so this is, this is the, the complicated thing because I, I need to keep track not only of the local concentration, but I need to keep track of the adjacent concentration because the zooplankton that are in the edge here, he's, he's happening on the, on, the, on the box on the side. So this, I need to, to write the changes in, due to volume. I need to know the, the concentrations around this, this box here. So I'm, I'm basically trying to write a function. So we are, we are moving towards writing a function for the changes in, in numbers for the growth, fluxes, and everything. And, and an important property that I'm trying to imply here is that the system is Markovian, in the sense that I do not need to keep track of the past. So like the, the concentrations at the next hour is not going to give in, is, can be written as a function of the concentration at the hour before. I don't need to keep track the many hours before, like one day before, because there is no memory there. And I think, yeah, so there is no memory, so I'm going to just take some more time. So the system is Markovian because there is a time scale separation. Movement and demographic events occur in a very different time scale. So the zooplankton is moving very fast, at a, very fast, at a centimeter per second, but reproduction takes days. So when reproduction happens, the spatial structure already relaxed to the state that the spatial structure should be for the given concentrations in the system. So the spatial, the, the spatial structure relaxes much faster than demographic events. So we, we can use the Markovian process, uh, property for this case. Yeah. Just one question, because I think that it's very interesting, and I want to know if anything you're listening to this. Yeah. Um, so in the intuition point of view, it's like you're trying to write, for example, a master equation for the box and not yeah. for everything in the table space. So you want to see, like, what are the probabilities for this box to have different numbers of everything? Right? Yeah, that's it. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I want to have a, f a function that, is a fun that, that depends on the present is concentrations that I have in my system. Yeah. Thanks. We are going to reach a PDE at the end. Yeah. So I need to do a lot of things to get this PDE, and I, I need to test this, this system that I'm using at with different sizes because I want to know if my, my system that I chose is going to change, that maybe the result's going to change if I select different boxes, and I don't want that. I want to make sure that when the system scales, things are still behaving as, a, as it should. And I, of course, check this for different particle numbers, for difficult swimming speed, for different tube density, and for different properties in order to calibrate what's going to, to be our equation. And uh, tomorrow, again, I'm going to go a little bit more deep here and how the data look like and how I, I, I construct these equations. But in the end, what we have is a scalable density field description. So we have a description that is not only describing the very, very large scale, but it's describing the whole range between micro and macro. Not the very micro, because we have the limit of the elementary volume, but f beyond that, we have a, a density field description that, can, that is fully first, because it's fully parameterized by an individual-based model, so all the parameters in our individual-based model are here, and a very, and there is a very strong connection between the two things, and also the, it's the scalable. And we have these two terms, the reaction term related to the reproduction, eating, death, and this type of things, and transport which is related to uh, turbulence, advection, and, uh, and the behavior of the zooplankton which is trying to move towards phytoplankton. So the equation have very trivial parts and a non-trivial part. So for you guys that are very familiar with this, so phytoplankton reproduction has a logistic growth, and this logistic growth doesn't depend on interaction, just how many food phytoplankton has. And this is what's set by us. 
So we, we told phytoplankton, you're going to reproduce uh, with a rate of one per day, and uh, the amount of food that you have, which is represented by the carrying capacity, is X. We set that. So this is, this is the, no, the known fun part, but again, this was uh, supported by the coarse graining procedure, and this term was not set by hand. This actually emerged, even that's the trivial one. And also for the zooplankton death rate, is also set by us. We said zooplankton will live for a couple of days, and this is also and the D here is also set by us, but also appeared from the coarse graining procedure. What we don't know is how grazing is, because we have this macro scale structure. And these two terms here represent you see a cross term here, PZ, so this is the interaction term between concentrations of phytoplankton and concentration of zooplankton. But the encounter rate yeah yeah. No, no, it's 100. It's a number. But how does it relate to the microscopic analysis? No, there is no relation. The, 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 the K is not, um, is not uh, an emergent property of the, the IBM. It's like we say that the carrying capacity at the, that, that domain is uh, 100 or 1,000. That's the, the thing. What, what, what does it come from? Oh, okay, what is not clear, okay, okay. So we tell the phytoplankton to reproduce one a day, but then this rate is going to be uh, diminished as the phytoplankton concentration becomes very high. Ah, so yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, 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 yeah, I said this. So this is very, there is no interesting thing here. So it doesn't come from an interaction? No, no interaction. This term and this term is only related to the individuals themselves what they see and what we set in our model. The only term that's related to interaction is this guy here. And if we had well-mixed species, G of P is a constant. And this is, gives you the logical of equation, like the standard one. So you have the logistic growth, like a um, and the and PZ times a constant, because they are well-mixed. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to derive, actually, what would be the well-mixed uh, constant there. And, uh, and see what is the thing there. And, but we have a, a density, dependency, density dependent effect that we could not predict doing any kind of heuristic there. Actually, you can, but we are gonna lose a lot if you do it. And of course, you have the noise here because the things are stochastic. And of course, if you do very large systems, this noise goes down because you reach the mean field limit. And the transport terms are much uglier. <laughs> so, so, but you, 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 I, I, can, I can guide you uh, uh, because there are easy terms here. So let's start. So we have a little bit of diffusion, which is basically uh, uh, summarizing the effects of fluctuations at, at the scales below the, the grid scale. We set a grid scale, and everything that's happening inside this grid scale is be become a diffusion term in terms of turbulence. Here's a diffusion term, so you see the velocity the velocity of the flow here, and the same for both species. They, they are both, be, both being drifted by the, the large eddies that we have in the ocean. And here there is a very fancy term that comes from the behavior of phytoplankton and resembles the keller siegel chemotactic term. And very interestingly, we see that the, the chemotactic sensitivity is logarithm in the sense that the, the zooplankton, in our, because in our model, the zooplankton do not have a difference in detection for just one phytoplankton or hydro. So the, the zooplankton has the same detection probability for a few or for a very large number of phytoplankton. And this is all, all of this came directly from the coarse grain procedure. We didn't write these equations by ourselves. Sorry, Eduardo, there's something I didn't understand. Yeah. Uh, when you assume, for instance, in the, in the lower field form, when you assume that the Those one. Yeah, and you're assuming that this grazing function is something that happens upon these two guys find each other, right? Yes. So how do you coincide that with the fact that you do have the species? So what I'm thinking is that when you have this turbulent mixing, uh, I don't see that clearly that the encounter rate increases 
that way with the concentration of particles. You know what I mean? Because that's, that comes from a swing ball mystery. That comes from the law of mass action. Yeah. So if you have swing ball mystery even within the box, for instance, that box that you have there. Yeah. Uh, so you are, are you doing any approximation there? Or? Mm. No, no. So I, I watched this box like in the present time, and I watched what happened in the next hour. And the and the number of phytoplankton that were eating, eaten by the, the by the zooplankton is given by this. Uh, I, I I I don't do any any kind of approximation. I just I just checked. But that's because you have a lot of phytoplankton. Why a lot? Yeah. And two green points. Yeah. This is not this is not a rev. This is not like uh, yeah. Go go on go on. To me, it's hard to believe that if I go to four and four, the cancer rate will scale that way. Because you know what I mean. I mean, when you have that, if you assume that encounter, the intuition that I have that might be wrong, very likely. Okay. The intuition that I have is that every single phytoplankton cell is. Yeah, and this is uh, yeah okay. This is this is actually happening because things are being mixed there. So eventually, everyone bumps into each other. So we we have um, yeah we have some sort of like as as Nathan mentioned, if I remove turbulence, strange things can happen, right? Because we are not going to have any kind of interaction between species there. But so that is correct because you are in the regime in which you show that the, the you show that the NEC is stabilized uh, a couple of slides ago, you know, like yeah. that is correct only because you have that regime. Yeah. So because you have a lot of phytoplankton and you have some sort of you can analyze some sort of volume. I I I'm not sure if I I, I get uh, the the point that you are yeah, but, but I, I want to, to understand. Uh, but one thing that I should mention is that like for, for a very low uh, particle number, this equation is still valid, but the noises are going to be high. So we have a lot of fluctuations, and uh, the encounter rates are going to be very, very uh, stochastic. But for large systems, these this terms become dominant. But yeah, we can, we can uh, discuss later. And the terms that, are, that emerge from the, let's say, that are non-trivial are the, the encounter rate here, and uh, these this two guys here that comes from the swimming parts of the phytoplankton. And just to show what happened here, so this is like a, a measure uh, as, so I let the system evolve, the particles numbers are changing with, with time, and the phytoplankton is experiencing different numbers of phytoplankton there. And as this happens, the, the encounter rate uh, changes like this. So for very large number of phytoplankton, the encounter rate goes to the well-mixed limit. Because if you are swimming and there is a lot everywhere, it doesn't matter, right? So if, if there is a lot and you swim, this is not going to change the encounter rates that a passive grazer is going to experience. So uh, for very large concent uh, resource concentration, swimming doesn't matter. But for very low concentration, uh, we see a deviation from the well-mixed regime and uh, the, the active grazer is encountering much more food than the passive grazer would. And this is the density dependent uh, feedback and the exponent of this law here is a specific for our model and how VZ and how the swimming speed and turbulence control this, this phenomena is uh, it's, it's also given by the, the coarse graining procedure. So, uh, yeah, so let me, yeah, I think I didn't show here. So, is, is there any question? No. no. Okay. So, like, how, how strong this effect is is controlled by this tug of war between turbulence and behavior, and also the flux here. We measure the same thing. We, we show that the fluxes for phytoplankton jumps are proportional to the difference between densities between cell. So, this could like some of these things could be predict, but the intensity and how they change with the traits that we have in our OBM cannot be understood precisely without doing this coarse graining procedure. Eduardo, yeah. Two questions. Um, so if I understood right, you're writing this uh, for like what is happening in the box and taking into account everything that happens in the individual-based model. What I'm trying 
going to this countries, you, you said it is really important to set a box size. Yeah. But to write those equations, you do need, uh, do you need to like, does the box size matter anything for those equations? Below a certain critical size, no. No, like, for example, if you write those equations. Sorry, ab above a critical size. Yeah, for, uh, for, to write those equations, you only need the rules in the individual base model, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but what I'm trying to understand is, for the math that you're doing here, is there something that the size of the box matters for you to, to leading to these equations? Or like, uh, does the size of the box makes you don't need to do some sort of approximation, something like this? Yeah, the, the idea that we want is that we want that to not depend. Because if we have like a functional form that is depending on the size of the box and realize that you want this very messy, and we don't have here, the size of the box is only regulating the stochasticity in our equation. Okay, so. but if the size of the box is like, it doesn't matter for doing all those equations, yeah. and all those equations come directly from the individual based model, why don't you just set the size of the box to be like, going to zero and have a description for like each point of space. I, I, I can't have like, uh, I can't have a very small box, right? No, yeah, yeah, I understand because the size of the box kind of matters for you to get like yeah. a picture of this what happened in the microscopic. But if this equation describes something for any size of box, yeah. okay. if you go to zero, it was like... I, I got your equation. So uh, that's something that I, I, I can uh, take more time. If you can see the size of the box is explicit, is explicit in the equations. Uh -huh. So because I'm writing the Laplacian terms using the, the, the lattice size. So this is not, a, there is no special dimension. And I move the, the, the scale to, to uh, like outside the differential operator. And then we can see, so what we can see here, sorry to uh, maybe correct myself. So for very, very large size boxes, the transport terms like this guy is going down is going to disappear. This guy is going up because you don't have one. You're considering thousands of kilometer box. So movement is all encapsulated by the box. So several of those, those terms are, are and recover the, the mean field limit. So you can have just the ODE for your big, big, big box. This is true. The importance of the terms are going to of the, with the resolution that you but the dynamics and the functional forms don't. That's the, 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 the critical point. And uh, so what, what this gives us is a bottom-up perspective. So we have a theoretical foundation for the formation of large-scale parts in marine microbial ecosystems. We know from the really bottom level how those large-scale patterns emerge. But more importantly, we are interested in, in a top-down perspective. How can we watch these large-scale patterns and infer what's going on at the bottom of the level? So this is more the technical part, and now I'm going to apply this for something. So this is come the application. So we are going to simulate a phytoplankton bloom. Okay, so a phytoplankton bloom is something that surges because of a nutrient, uh, a nutrient, a lot of nutrient comes to the system because of vit vertical mixing, and then we have a, a, a peak when the bloom comes and, and becomes, reaches its maximum concentration, and then the concentration goes down because the zooplankton population keeps up and eats everything. So this is the typical scenario, and it is actually a result from one of our simulations. And these are more pictures about phytoplankton blooms. They can be very different. And the structural variations of those, those blooms have not been explained yet from the bottom-up perspective. So, and this guy here did recently a very, a very nice work. So he studied different phytoplankton blooms across different species and performed what I, what I told you about the transect. So they took sheep at different situations in the ocean and measure how the blooms are, the structure of the blooms. And this is a very illustrative way of uh, characterizing the structure of the bloom. So some blooms are, are like smooth and very homogeneous, as you can see here. So they are basically have a, 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 a very background and steady concentration. But in some cases, we see these very fragmented uh, situations here. And the authors did here a very amazing and large study of all these but in the end, they say that they don't know why, why this is happening. So they show, for instance, that the, this, the, the fragmentation is related to the size of the phytoplankton, but they don't know why this is happening. They just found this correlation. 
But the, 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 the sentence that I would like to, to, to stress is this sentence that goes back to the problem of scale. So, and they are even citing uh, a paper that talks about the problem of scale that, sh that says if we need to mechanistically understand th these things and try to solve this problem of scale to actually answer why this structural variation exists. So this was a very, uh, very interesting situation that we can apply our theory to understand how phytoplankton move changes as a function of behavior and important uh, trait uh, elements there. So uh, what I did was to create this search of nutrient. So I created a band. So we're talking, it's important to mention the scale now. We are talking about centimeters now. We're talking about 100 kilometer domain size. And I, and, I, and I set a nutrient band profile here in the center. So we have a surge of nutrient at, this, at the middle of the do domain. But the surge is controlled by this. So K, K bar is what, I, what I'm showing here. So the, so the carrying capacity now is varying in space and is being mixed by flow and is always trying to restore to the K-bar profile, which is this one that I, that I set here. But of course, this is not possible because Tubbins is trying to avoid that. So this is a picture of uh, phytoplankton boom for a 100-kilometer domain uh, for passive grazers. So nobody is doing anything interesting here. Phytoplankton and zooplankton are both passive, and they are just being moved by the flow. And this is the type of thing that you, you see. So uh, patterns tend to fluctuate a little bit. So this is the carrying capacity. So you see that's not a band, because they're everything around. And phytoplankton here is in green, and zooplankton in, in red. And phytoplankton distribution is smooth, more or less, has some variations, and zooplankton is very strongly correlated because zooplankton is only finding, finding food when there is a lot there. So when zooplankton now becomes a swimmer and the swimming velocity is non-zero, we see these changes. So the, phyto, the, the bloom becomes more fragmented, okay? We see that, and, the, and more importantly, the edges are being, are being very sharp, right? So the edges here are much more smooth, and here the edges are very, very sharp. Why? So now for this problem, I can give a mechanistic explanation for why this is happening. So zooplankton that are active are much better finding food in low resource concentrations than passive grazers. Because passive zooplankton are, rarely they are gonna bump in a phytoplankton and, and, and catch them, but an active, and zooplankton is going to eat much more than a passive one in those cases. And that's why the edges in which we have a very low concentration of zooplankton, uh, sorry, a very con low concentration of phytoplankton, they eat and trim the edges. So the boundaries of the, f the bloom become more sharp. So more fragmented as we have higher velocities. So this is moving towards giving explanation structures variation structures in, the, in phytoplankton blooms from this bottom-up perspective. And as I mentioned before, uh, our interest, so let, let's try to couple things now. So this is like passive, just recall you what we, sh we saw in the beginning. This is what is happening at the macro level here in this case. But in this case, we see, we see this type of things. We are not simulating both things simultaneously, of course, but this is what is expected to be happening at this point here. And finally, uh, I move towards creating a map between micro and macro here. So understanding that the phytoplankton uh, active behavior is um, sharpening the edges of the bloom, we measure the, how the curvature of the bloom depends on, on phytoplankton concentration. And the slope of this line gives a strong indication of the signatures of behavior in the phytoplankton bloom. And what we, what we we're able to do is to connect the swimming speed of the, phyto, of the zooplankton with the sharpness of the phytoplankton. So by watching phytoplankton blooms and measuring the sharpness of the edges, we can know which type of zooplankton is there. Remember that zooplankton are not seen from satellite images, right? So when I take a picture of a phytoplankton bloom, I don't know what is there eating. I don't know what other species are eating those phytoplankton blooms. Can infer this since we have this powerful connection between these two, these two types, um, these two extreme scales. 
so this is the, the, the final result that we, um, that we managed to get. And now the very hard work from an ecological perspective is try to go through those results that we saw and try to see, and it's a very hard work to understand how the species are connected, which type of zooplankton is each eating, what type of phytoplankton, and uh, verify that our model is actually explaining those structural variations. And um, a lot of perspectives. Uh, we, we are collaborating with a couple of people to apply this network, uh, this framework to a, a lot of different things. So with uh, climate change, turbulence can change, a lot of things can happen in the ocean, and we want to understand how grazier behavior or zooplankton behavior is going to change and be affected by uh, environmental changes. And a very interesting that I actually have been working more is, is about infected blooms. So when a virus infects a, a phytoplankton, it promotes changes in physiology. So phytoplankton can become sticky, can aggregate, and this changes the structure at, at the bottom of the sea. So uh, zooplankton is going to eat different things. Zooplankton is going to, sh to shift the feeding preferences because of an infection. So we can detect infections just by watching the shape of the phytoplankton bloom. And this is a nice work that's been done by uh, a colleague in another university that they watched that the, the shape and, the, and how the, the, the spatial temporal dynamics of a phytoplankton bloom changes with viruses, and our theoretical framework can uh, provide a mechanistic explanation for that. And it's, uh, at the same time, it's very well known that spatial patterns can give us signatures of a critical and a regime shift. So we are thinking about how we can use this to identify uh, when we are approaching or detecting a change in the, in the, in the ocean or the, in the food web in the ocean just by watching phytoplankton blooms. It's very tricky to do with this by measuring in situ observations. Yeah, so thank you very much. A lot of references here. Uh, yeah, you guys already asked. I can, of course, see others. And tomorrow my plan is to show the problem of scale that we have. We start with uh, PDE, which is the most uh, usual way, easiest way to, to uh, uh, a dynamics for uh, two species interacting. And I'm going to show how this is a problematic and how, and then we are going to try to derive this by hand that I just do doing a coarse graining procedure. And I'm going to show that it's going to fail. <laughs> and I'm going to show that the coarse graining procedure that we did is the, is the, is the way to, to, to do it and, and have this strong connection between micro and macro. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for instance, tomorrow I'm going to, to try to get um, how the clumps are for a simple model, how, how correlations emerge for a simple model. And we are going to do like um, simple calculations. And in the end, you're going to see that for, already for a very minimalistic model, you arrive to a very nonlinear equation that you cannot solve. And then you need to do a numerical procedure to get the solutions for this nonlinear equation. And then we're already doing computation and, 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 and uh, already simulate. So if you can write an equation, and then perhaps you can do a numerical, sim a numerical integration of this equation or solving them numerically, you perhaps are doing more or less what, what I'm doing. But you cannot do this for very complicated individual-based models. So for my case, maybe we should try and can try to uh, get those, and I tried, uh, and, and, I, and I got some of, the, of those results doing uh, analytical uh, procedures and doing uh, some approximations. But in the end, uh, you, you lose the details of how things are connected to the trade. So we are gonna, tomorrow I'm going to, uh, to present, for instance, trait-based models. Trait-based models actually try to map the response functions to a trait, and you can use heuristic um, reasoning to do that. And this is, has been the standard for the recent uh, past years. But then we, you, lose, you lose features when you, you do this. Again, if you were able to account for higher order terms, 
in a path integral formalism or a fancy and sophisticated analytical procedure, then you can do it. But if you can't and you need to trun truncate, eliminate high order programs, you're going to lose a lot of the details that we have here. Yeah, and you can do very complicated. So we are, we are planning to, um, to apply this, uh, th this cost graining procedure to game, uh, game theoretical IBMs. So when individuals are interacting through games and through, through forces, so we have very complicated IBM uh, regulating evolution and this, those kind of things. You can, if you're really good, perhaps some of you are really good on this, you can write an equation, but you're going to find a very messy situation. And a, a computational gauss graining procedure can give you a strong connection that you're probably not, not going to have uh, and, and uh, I don't know, and avoid a lot of work that perhaps you can do it computationally. Um, yeah. Final one. Um, you started from a problem, no? And yeah. you go to a bigger question. I guess at some point you are taking part of this, right? So your yes. fields are very different. Uh -huh. Could you show, for instance, this bilinear term, like uh, I think it was P times C, the one that I want. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you take averages there, in principle, that should be the average of P times C. Yes. But there you have the average of P times the average of C. Yeah, yeah sorry, the, the average are not there. So what I have, I, 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 yeah, I can, I can do this. Okay, if this is related to tomorrow, we can talk. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but you mentioned what I have is like, I have for a certain T, I have the, the P, I have the Z, and I have the delta P plus, which is the number of phytoplankton that were generated, the number of phytoplankton that were killed, and the number of zooplankton that were generated, and the number of zooplankton that died. That, that died. And I do this for T plus one, and I do the, the same thing, and I have this. And then what you, you need to do is try to write how delta P plus can be written as a function of those guys here. And you try to find a function that represents this. So these guys both are changing with time, and I have this, and I try to get this. And this is going to be our, like in the case for the minus, which is the eaten, phytoplankton eaten. This is going to be, um, this is going to be our P, Z, G of P. Yeah, that's a good question. So, like, so, so those numbers are, are, are stochastic processes, right? So, in the end, what we have, uh, in the end, what we have is like the probability. So, I'm going to, to, to write this better. Uh, so, the probability of delta P minus, okay, is going to be like a, a Gaussian, like a norm, uh, a normal function. And the, the mean is going to be this. And the variance, because this is like a, this is like a, like a Poisson process. So the, the mean is going to just, the, the variance is just proportional to the mean here. So yeah, so th th those things are not constant and are not like, they, they are stochastic values and they depend on this. And fortunately, they give us Gaussian-like noises, which I, I was able to write as a Langevin-style equation, right? But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They depend, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, so the, the variance here for this this guy here is the same, like this, because they they are Poisson processes and they they work like this because they come from a Poisson process and in the end they become like a Gaussian term like this. Yeah, but yes, they, they, it's a multiplicative noise there. Yes. So like, you basically have now an n number of boxes. 
Yeah. But then you get to, like, at least in my mind, when you're dividing people, most of them you will have, like, some, not, a, you wouldn't get to a PBE, but you will get to, like, some, a lot of OPE here. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. Basically, a couple of these become a PDE in the end, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Th th that's a good question, and I think it's related to. This. So, uh, so like, so you see that the transport terms have all noises, right? So when I have a box here, it's the same. So I have a box here. Uh, let me do the, the. So we have a, this this main box and, and the adjacent ones. So the flow here, is also a stochastic process like this. Yeah. So we actually, like the diffusion term and the, the couple PDE, is is the mean value of these fluctuations of the noise here. The mean value of these guys, but yeah, they are somehow ODE coupled. But then you can write like this. Yeah, but just just remember that. So this, I'm simplifying here. So I have I have much more terms here, right? Because I'm keeping track of this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And it's like for 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 our for our case, this can be like a lot of uh, like using a very strong tool to solve a not so complicated IBM. But for us, it's an opportunity to to open uh, for new perspectives using this procedure. Take a break until tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow we'll see the continuation. So, so let's thank Eduardo again. Thank you.